Hello, how are you doing? And uh, welcome to Delbus and People uh, YouTube page. We're just getting up and rolling right now, so it's not much on here for content yet. But uh, I don't know. Maybe you'll be watching this for the first time years from now, and and there will be by then. Who knows? Right now, I'm finishing up a little. It's too small. I broke the. I broke the uh, string here a few times. I was just doing this for demonstration. But um, so this, these would be like some uh, influence from a discovery in in Siberia of a uh, Neanderthal cave, and this piece of antler here. It's grooved in the end, and they and there are certainly some pieces that are perforated that are teeth and stuff and and they call them necklaces because obviously a archaeologist would look at that and think that it's necklace which I agree it's designed to hang off of something or carry but what if it's something more than a necklace so you're probably wondering well what does that have anything to do um, with uh, with uh, cultural complexes, which is what they state of a people that they have a particular, it can be a particular um, way of doing something, a particular technique, uh, language, uh, a lot of different things can be a cultural complex of a people. So our, one of our cultural complexes is uh, a way of flint napping that is unique. Um, Certainly there are people know of indirect percussion and direct percussion and, and, uh, and using antler tines and things, but, um, but our way is going a little deeper than that, of looking at all these pieces in the archaeological record that have no known use or, um, or perhaps we believe that they were used in a different manner. A manner that is uh, it's very productive and makes sense. So I'm going to share with you some of that today about our cultural complex that as far as I know because all of these pieces have sat from the graves coming forward to museums and to and they've all said there's no known use. There aren't any tribes in the United States uh, that utilize these things in the in the way that I'm going to show you so let's take this piece here okay now let's go from Siberia okay and we fast forward to say Germany paleocide in Germany now one thing that we're trying to show it with Dilbus and people is is that there is this relationship. If you believe in one first man, first woman, then you have to believe that we're all related. And then the question just comes, why so many tribes? Why so many peoples have broken away from one people? And it could be uh, arguing over natural resources, over, over things. And, um, but what we try to do is we look at different things all over the world and see the commonality. Now there's commonality in things that I'm going to show you, um, but the, there's also commonality in that they still have the same unanswered questions as to what they are, what they were used for. So we'll go f fast forward to Germany, okay, and we again see pieces that are are somewhat similar in shape, okay, and they would call them alls, you know, but if you look at a lot of pieces that they say are alls, what you would look at if you look real closely is you'll see what looks like a little bit of a line or even a compression across here and the end is pristine. Sometimes it is used on the end, but, and then the other side will be beaten many times and sometimes there will be uh, a knife shape on one side or um, uh, let me see here can be a bigger piece that's um, 
it's like this and what you're looking for are shapes these these shapes and oftentimes they're they're quite small sometimes they're quite large and long piece of antler or a stick with a sharpened on the end this is what's called an ishi stick this is more approximate to size of the of the one that ishi used the last of the ahi and um in more contemporary flint napping today, now this has a piece of buffalo in the end, more contemporary flint napping today, the, the sticks are much longer, the Ishii sticks, and they're used copper. I'm getting sidetracked a little bit. So there's where you'll see some pieces that are long, and so again, for flint napping, could be used in the same manner that I'll demonstrate at some point down the road, and utilizing an Ishii stick. So we look in Germany at the pieces that are there and this tapered. And then we have in that same side a, a, a piece that they call a whistle. And it is quite loud and but what I do of this process when I'm flint napping is I'm looking at all these pieces and just like what jumps out from the grave of Pickwick Man buried with pieces that and an arrow shaft wrench is then you insert the tool and say let's go to let's put this one away let's just go to one and we'll even leave it on the necklace here insert it right in the necklace and that little wrapping around there I found actually helps to hold it in place even even a little better I think it snugs it in real nice let's see. Grab us something to tap it with. Could be another piece of antler, something that you're going to carry along with you, because like these tools, you want to wear them. I can use this, or um, since we're talking about prehistoric times, and you know, and not like today when somebody goes camping and they they take the whole kitchen sink and everything else with them. You have to use things for multiple purposes. So perhaps you're using that for an awl, but then you're also utilizing it for flint napping as well. It flakes, it makes very nice. I'm not going to do very much right now because that's not my purpose. My purpose right now, there'll be lots of videos. If you go on to my Emory Caudel on my or search for ABONAP or ABO and then uh, KNA PPER ABONAPER, there's lots and lots of videos of me making points all the way through completion on Facebook Live. So anyways, I better stop there before I get carried away. But as you can see that, now, what about these teeth here? Well, what if we have another, what if we have something like Otzi, his tools that he was using that it was discovered that he had a, uh, he had a handle you can see here's one like this, one like this. If archaeologists found this, they would say that it was going to be a knife handle. But if I insert this in here like this, okay, now I'm able to use it. And, and the uh, hardest part on the tooth is the enamel. Now things like elk, elk have two um, teeth that are are um, are 
all ivory. So you can utilize those. And then there's other animals that ivory. And certainly when you're talking of mastodon times, there's lots of ivory there as well. But then we're able to utilize this and put our finger here on the curved portion. And I don't know what I just did with that point. like this. Oh, except that piece just pulled right there. So this would be for some fine finishing. So this would be for finishing flakes or resharpening. You can see the very fine flakes that that flakes off. Okay. So the um, Let's go continue around the world here. So let's go back to Russia. Okay. Put this back in here because I'm going to utilize it later on. So we go to Russia and. Set this back here. And we see tools shaped like this. And then we go, and then also tools shaped like this. Now this one here, this is a replica from Murray Springs in Arizona. They call it an addle addle uh, shaft wrench or a perforated staff. And um, and they're still not sure. They said they don't know for sure what it was. I have videos, and I'm not going to go into that, of demonstrating putting a, a, a limb in here, pulling it, and fluting Clovis points with it. Um, there are things on these shaft wrenches that don't make sense. One, primarily this side of the hole is generally larger than the back side of the hole. As well, a lot of times the use, you'll see marring going from side to side, or an, an illogical angle if someone's using it for leverage, especially on a shaft that would be of consistent size and not tapered. But if we take tools that we discover in places uh, like Hohokam sites and stuff and you go back farther and, and again someone could claim this to be an awl like this and then we um, find some hay here this cross here this works a lot better when you have some hay like this then we could put these pieces in here like this as an insert now if we wanted to get some harder material here like this flint shirt I guess we can call it so we can do like this we can put on using this as an insert we can use our leg for driving leverage as leverage of pushing as well uh, for another process if not with this type of insert we can biface with it works best if you have a debitage pile. I'll show you here. Debitage. I got a little bit down here, not much. Kind of roll it in that. Put it in here. Trying to get it to grab.
That's some tough stuff. Generally, he was probably going to be using something else for this type of a situation, but just to show you in a in a uh, survival situation, you, you would definitely be able to do that. Yeah. Well, he would be using a stone for this type of material, I guarantee. Let's go to something a little softer like this obsidian here. Can buy a face with it as a handle. You can see a nice thin long flake there. So there's that method, and you could use it in indirect percussion like this. And my striker. Now this is a little bit overkill for this big of a piece here. This isn't a very big piece. So this acts as a support. Now we can go and um, let's see. So let's go over to say um, Blackwater Draw. So this one here is is very old. You can see I've had this since I was a kid. So you can see this very old, old piece here. Blackwater draw style billets were, were short. Uh, some, I know one person who uses it as, uh, there's one person documented using them as indirect percussion. And then there's another one named uh, Paleo Man 52, I think, something like that. And he uses them in this manner right here holding them in this manner and flint napping like this which is definitely logical okay and then what uh, what I started thinking along the lines as well is because I there are some that are are rather small, very small pieces, and that it was hypothesized using them in indirect percussion, hitting, hitting them. So um, eventually, what I started to do was uh, come up with the theory of in a in another form of flint napping that I call reverse channel um, uh, punching uh, on an anvil log of holding it, keeping your fingers out of the way, pulling, and then holding your hand against the piece, pulling pressure against it and then striking it. Then eventually that morphed as well and it was successful and 
and then that morphed as well into this and thinking along the lines of how man evolved into having a hatchet and having things that were fixed like this. So again, taking that black water draw style billet, wrapping some leather around it, which man would have had with him. Um, and then, uh, and then being able to utilize it in this way with your hands out of the way. See? So there's a cultural complex because nobody has ever had ever demonstrated it in this manner before, of putting leather around it and utilizing it like a hatchet. Now I'll go one step further. So you see the, the piece of wood that's inserted in there. Um, if you go to early books and things like that and it shows uh, bifacing pieces like this in this manner they're using very big moose billets and uh, and so when they came up with uh, um, and there's a, a uh, experimental archaeology he's not an archaeologist but uh, works in our experimental archaeology like I do and his name's Nap Yucatan Benjamin Abel and he was uh, really going and confronting people and at the time I was using larger billets that were of uh, uh, that were of um, dog wood of wood and longer than this and bigger than this and so I was listening to what he was saying and challenging the community that none have ever been discovered in the archaeological record that are very big moose billets of which those who do do abo style flint napping were utilizing and I had one my myself as well and so I got to thinking about that and then I got to also shortening up pieces and then utilizing them in a way of putting leather around the back wrapping them around your hands where you can get more uh, leverage and showing them in that manner so you take this crossed here like this and again going with that man didn't have particularly hunter-gatherer he would be wearing things that he had as jewelry, things like that. Um, then you would be able to take a smaller, using leverage, taking a smaller piece of wood. Um, wood is one of the most uh, underrated things that there are, and I think in the archaeological record, and so many pieces in in the museums that that I utilize that. Um, that other that archaeology just seems to overlook so then you can wrap this around here like this and now slide this forward and now you have a smaller tool utilized for a bigger method so in texas there was a piece that was in texas that he was getting some rebuttal on of saying well no there's a there's pieces in uh, the archaeological record um, that are um, this is certainly not as big as the moose antler, but uh, but pieces that are that are there um, that are billets, and we're not talking about the not talking about the um, blackwater draw blackwater draw style war billets because they examined it and seen that there were um, embeddings in there of of pieces of flint and the use that was on them that's what they labeled as like that for so I did research and and the one that people kept pointing to as this large billet was reclassified it's no longer classified as a billet because it was classified as a as a, uh, a pestle um, utilized with paints it had paint they do did found new new discovery of a process of examining the artifact so this is one method that uh, at the time a long time ago I I was very I'm still very proficient with wood but so this goes to show 
you're able to utilize that in that manner. So then let's go to the next. So here's the same type of principle of utilizing wood just like you would using mastodon ivory or these other small pieces. Here's a piece of wood that uh, you're able to utilize in the same manner. Here's a chunky piece here. So I start thinking, you know, I think of the lineage of things, how we get from man not having hatchets and everything, using hand tools to then eventually hafting things. So was this a transition to where it didn't even start like this, it just started out as a piece of leather wrapped around like this and then held in place with the fingers like this. That's how I've demonstrated in the past as well. Utilizing, you know, where's that piece of stone? It's gotta be right here. I didn't, oh, there it is. Ah. See? Utilizing in this manner here. Much safer, your fingers are out of control, and you can get more leverage coming into it. Uh, which is what you need, particularly with very hard stone, is that that leverage really makes a big difference because you have to put a lot of force on there. So I think you get the idea with this here. Okay, so now we know that pieces were used as punches and drifts, so let's go to the punches and drifts. So if you go to like the um, Clovis site um, in, um, in Montana, the Anzic One site, I'm dead. Uh, genetically related to Anzic One more so than Kennewick Man, which I'm related to genetically as well. Um, so, going to Anzic One, you find tools again somewhat similar when you're looking at pieces like this. It's made to a, a sculpting, a, a sloping on the end, an angle, beveled. Um, and you are able to utilize that in pressure flaking, I believe, but also as an insert and using them as an insert. Um, so then we have tools that are in the archaeological record at uh, um, Peabody, Harvard Peabody Museum, that resemble this, a little bit shorter than this. And, um, and then we have pieces that are called drift punches. I have some that are made of wood, some of antler. So we take these drift punches and then we take a well-known tool. Now again, you can utilize this like I was saying before of putting the leather around it, pulling it with your finger and pulling it into the piece and striking and keeping your fingers out of the way. That's something that wasn't ever demonstrated before either. So that is also another cultural um, complex that we have. Uh, but I was looking at one time, one of my mentors was the, uh, the chief of Northern Aztec tribe, Jim Fire Eagle. And uh, him and I spent many summers together where I used to live on the Gila River Indian community. And um, I'm not a member of the tribe, by the way, I need to specify that, even though my grandfather's buried there. He's not a member either, he's buried there out of honor. Um, and I just say that, uh, I say that because I don't want to confuse my art with art of the author. I'm influenced by them, but that's all that I can say. 
places that I'm influenced. But um, so I was looking at this. I made a replica, which was actually this antler here. This is a replica of the Pickawick man. It was a burial believed to be a flint napper. And this device here, they call arrow shaft wrench. And there are a lot of them. They're this kind of arrow shaft wrench or like the Murray Springs style or the, or then they'll have some that are ribs that have a hole through it. Um, and uh, believe that the arrow shaft was put in there and it was straightened. But again, some things weren't making sense because the top front hole is larger than the back hole and many a times you can see this when this was created a year ago this one's been retired over a year ago the hole was the exact same diameter front to back now the hole is bigger in the front than it is in the back and if you look at the wit the wear it has a slight wear to the side here and you can see a little bit to the side there which would not be practical for putting in and adjusting uh, arrow shaft wrench this way you'd do logically the leverage would be across a straight piece in the same way with the pieces on the ribs but on the ribs many times you see the the marring at an angle as if a piece and again if you're straightening uniform shafts as I do when I straighten my arrows the shaft is already of a uniform uh, width the diameter would be the same on this side as it is the other side because the compression would be the same going each direction but it makes sense if something that was slightly tapered or even if it was the same size went in this is this one's for my newer one you can see how far the hole has drifted um, this tool is new and I've just made my new press this is the hole diameter that this started out as see how this fits in there like that and now look over a year as to how this fits in which eventually this would fracture if I kept went using it but I wanted to save this this part here is also the wedge shape of the Pickwick man's piece is also important because I believe you can hold it along the side of the leg, use it for um, uh, indirect or for direct per, uh, direct pressure flaking. Um, you can also do it as uh, um, Chief Jim Fire Eagle used to do and demonstrate on an anvil log holding this across your chest and pushing and popping the flakes. But, so I was thinking of, I was thinking of Jim, and I was outside and I was flint napping. And I, I had back surgery and many times disabled. I've got hardware in my back, my leg, and I was unable to, to flint nap hard flints anymore. And so I was starting to think about doing indirect percussion more or something I wanted to do hard flints and then I seen Pickwick man's um, base uh, burial and the arrow shaft wrench of antler which I've seen them before of antler and so I kept thinking about that and I made a duplicate a replica of it because I seen that on the Pickwick man's and I was sure that that's what it was so I wanted to do Jim's technique again to see how I would be able to handle it with my back and so I made that and and I went to doing that and I kept thinking about Pickwick man and then also those pieces that he was buried with and and all of a sudden I kept thinking and it was almost like someone tapped me on the shoulder I don't know maybe it was Jim Fire Eagle but I had a print out of that paper and I and and in my mind, all of a sudden, those pieces just jumped right into the hole. And I thought, wow, could it be? And so I took one of the um, punches, and, and then I inserted the drift punch into, into the piece. Okay. Uh, and then I started to 
to nap with it. And then, um, and the and what it did was showing the <laughs> it was just amazing. And so then before you know it, I'm doing back to doing flint pieces and even more so I started thinking about the Russia pieces that was like the Murray sh Springs shaped piece and then I made a duplicate of of one of those and uh, and started to play around with those and next thing you know that the shapes of those made sense as well of an insert into a base and then making another piece that went up through the center and then hitting down and the next thing you know I'm making my eccentrics over the top hitting this and being able to drive those pieces was it was it used that way for sure we don't know but um, the most important thing is it enabled me to do something that I wasn't able to do and it makes sense and so when you look at all these pieces and then when you look at pieces from this is from uh, there's a piece that's in um, in uh, Peabody Harvard that this one is my interpretation because the piece that's in the museum is fractured across here and interestingly this piece here which was the prototype you can see a fracture coming up across here so this piece was broken but you could see there was a hole and then along here this going across here you could see and this piece had been broken across here and so I took these exact measurements and made me what I interpret for it to be. Now this one again I'm retiring because I used it and I want to keep these pieces you can see some of the fractures over time I want to keep these pieces um, you know like my arrow shaft or, or wrench that um, I use I want to keep that to where um, it's going to stay whole and not fracture and break. So again these shapes like this this one is made out of um, buffalo. Um, he, uh, I have others that are made out of um, ram horn, which was uh, used by the Hohokam. Um, the shapes, uh, again, like there are some that are discovered that have been fractured. So you'll have this one piece and then another piece on the end that tapers. So again, you can take these like this. And so you're able to utilize in the same manner that I was showing you with the indirect percussion before. Uh, let's find a striker. As a piece. You can utilize the round pieces like this. This one here is a piece of um, ironwood. You can use them with antler. But these are called drift punches. And then, by the way, look at the use wear on the end of that. And you're going to see this same consistent use wear that you have on drift punches. Now is the archaeological community bracing this? I can say that there are a lot of people that are following what I'm doing but um, and I've got some pieces that have gone out for a thesis for a master's thesis I believe from 
an archaeologist, but um, they all say very interesting. <laughs> That doesn't make any difference because we aren't trying to convince anybody of anything. We are just trying to find a way that the youth are able to flint nap easier, elderly are able to flint nap easier, and taking a look at tools and offering a suggestion as to how we think it was done. And again, it is a cultural complex of the Delbison people because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So then I was looking at pieces that are spade and then I came across another pieces that had remember like this right here that had this length and I found another few pieces that had look like were base pieces and this is called pivot and fixed insert press process and devices. And so then I started looking at other pieces that were that were flat like this, kind of like the other pieces that I showed you from uh, from the Anzic one Clovis. child that was buried in Montana, Clovis. And so I started looking in Gila River Indian community, different places of, um, I think one was discovered uh, at uh, Pedro site, right where I used to live. That was a Ho'okam piece. And other, other Ho'okam pieces stretching all the way into, um, into uh, New Mexico and Chaco Canyon in places that are called spatulas and and utilized in this manner here and also wrapped I believe see those nice fine flakes let's pick up something harder here yeah. So this is an introduction to cultural complexes. We will have our own art. And this is just part one. I'll continue this because there's an awful lot to awful lot to this to share. I'll get into talking about clothing and influences of other cultures and where that came from and, and what I'm wearing and the influence of of this and and gifts and all of those kind of things and just the amazing, amazing things that we see that are common in archaeological places all over the world like the pucker toe moccasins in the bogs of Ireland, like the Coptic uh, tunics that resemble this. Um, these influences and questions of how man interacted and unfortunately uh, uh, most Native American tribes that I know, their governments are against DNA testing um, on the grounds of uh, it's intrusive or, uh, but 
then at the same time, I'm sure some of them that have casinos are okay with drug testing their employees. So I'm finding a hard time trying to understand how we're not wanting to get to the bottom of how we're all related. Because if we believe in traditional beliefs of first man, first woman, then we believe that we're all related. And it's there in our DNA. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching. And uh, I'll do another part two here in a little bit. Uh, maybe next few days after it's not so hot right now. Catch you later, bye.